So in the morning, we discussed uh, um, trust and security and sustainability. These were the two topics we were focusing on. And as you know, in the morning, we have our vision sessions. So we have postal CEOs there that share their experiences, that uh, share their views. Um, and uh, we had some very, very good discussions. And we had also a good involvement from the audience here. So I would ask you again, if you have questions, if you have views, if you have comments, get involved, raise your hands, stand up and, uh, and share it with the others here and ask questions to the panelists. So in the afternoon here, we are starting with trust and security. That's going to be our first session. Then we have a short break and then we have our sustainability session. Um, let me introduce now to you uh, the panelists of this trust and security session. We have Sven Kukemelk, he is the Vice President of International Business of Omniva. We have uh, Dipti Gupta, she is Global ProServe Supply Chain Solutions. That's a long word, isn't That's it? Uh, word. She is from Amazon Web Services. We have Brody Bula, he's the CEO of Escher Group. And we have Lati Matata, he's the director from the PTC, the Postal Technology Center at the UPU. And I would like to start right away with, uh, with a discussion or with the presentations first. And Sven, um, e-commerce and data, that's of course something that is very, very relevant. And maybe you would like to talk about security trust in that area. Thanks. Bearing in mind how short I am, I need to stand up so that you would all see me. So, <laughs> so please bear with me. So the question about e-commerce and data is that we can have a parcel, but if you actually don't know who it's for, from where, what is inside, then you can't process that, uh, that parcel. And the challenge we're facing in the postal world is that this kind of data gets mixed up. Someone orders a parcel on, let's say, AliExpress uh, from China. Then it is produced, sold. But in order to make sure that that data is not compromised, seen by no one, uh, anyone else, then some of the fields are deleted, then they reappear, then they delete them again, and then they reappear to be compliant with the GDPR and all of these requirements. And this is why we are seeing so many challenges linked with data security, and, and we're trying to avoid breaches, and that's why we don't enable the data to, to be seen by everyone. And as we do that, we're not able to offer ultimate service. We in Omniva have somewhere around 15% of parcels which is missing uh, vital data, which was there at the time of the development of that, uh, that parcel. So how do we, what is the solution which we could do in order to implement it? Well, everyone knows nowadays, when you have a smartphone, you can use Type-C charger because it's a standard. We've, we've established that this is the standard for how do we charge the phones. So why we wouldn't be able to implement all over the world that there is one integration standard for data, for example, based on blockchain. Blockchain allows you to uh, show the original data. You will be able to keep the same data flow. You don't have to cut it through into pieces, but you will actually be working all the time with the same data from the beginning all the way to the end. And, and why I, I talk about this part here in trust security, it is always about the trust that when we're working, for example, in Scandinavian market, a lot of people are afraid to give their phone numbers, email addresses to a Chinese vendor because I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know what's going to happen there. So how do we overcome that? And how do we actually make sure that last mile delivery for whom you're actually happy to give that data will receive the correct one? So one is data, and second one is safe and secure global shopping. Because if I order today a parcel from anywhere in the world, to be honest, then I need to always bear in mind, okay, if I pay it now and it doesn't get delivered, how do I get it returned? Because the legislation in each of the countries is different. And we don't have global products. We don't have global standards. Amazon sets their standard what they want eBay sets there, AliExpress, their standard, etc. And then we have the postal world, UPU, with their standards, which don't provide global COD, which doesn't provide global return solution, which doesn't <laughs> provide competitive uh, uh, global uh, pricing for the returns. Uh, even uh, inside the Europe, when we're talking about return service, I can get a uh, parcel delivered in Poland for two and a half euros in order to get the return six and a half euros. So why would a shopper or e-commerce platform be willing to put in six euros 
triple the price almost for a parcel which is actually loss making for him because return means that the trade didn't go through. It didn't happen as it, as it was supposed to. And then also where the same issue still with the global tracking that we still have products where in 2023 we're talking about that not all parcels have the tracking link to that. And this is, these are the key words which we need to make sure to implement if we actually want to make sure that we have a safe, secure and really truly global shopping opportunity available to our, uh, to our vendors uh, and, and people. So from my perspective, purchase has to be made easy and then we're really going to get into the global shopping, uh, shopping part. As long as we keep those barriers up, we're still going to see that. And that is very clearly linked with trust and security and how to make that trust and security transform into the uh, end consumer, the one who's actually making the choice on the platform and how we enable that also for the last mile deliveries that they get access to that kind of a data. So that's my starter. I'm pretty sure you're going to have afterwards good discussions. Perfect. And Thank you very much. That was perfect. And I mean, very much in time, only half the time <laughs> yeah, yeah. we've granted you. I haven't seen that just yet here, but that's good. Dipti, um, how does a robust data strategy now really enhance custom experience and also drive business value? Do you have some answers for that on that? Yes. Um, if I can figure out how to move the... Yeah, this is now... I think. <laughs> <laughs> I well, that's the closing, that's the closing <laughs> slide that we've seen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, so let me start off by introducing myself. Um, my name is Dipti Gupta and I head the logistics and transportation industry vertical within AWS, the professional services arm of AWS. So we work with customers in the logistics and tran transportation space uh, to solve their business problems. Uh, my background is in logistics and transportation for a very long time. Um, most recently, before joining AWS, I was leading a multi-carrier parcel shipping software company, uh, and we sold it to another company before I joined AWS, so have been in this space for a very long time. The world is changing. I, I order packages on, um, on Amazon.com. I order food on Uber Eats. And every time I order something on my phone, I look for tracking. I want to know exactly when I will get it, when I will get it, in what condition I'll get it. And if I'm not at home, how can I ensure that it gets delivered on time, right? So what, what that means is there is a lot of data that is being created. And as a consumer, I would like to consume that data. There is explosion of people and personas. Um, there is a shipper, somebody who's shipping the product, somebody who's, who's actually moving your, your packages and parcels or product, somebody who's actually receiving the package. And, and each of those personas have different requirements of what they want to see. Uh, and that is causing um, a, a, a need for having real-time decision-making with that data. I have a lot of data. I have a lot of expectations from my customers. And I need to leverage that data to do things and make decisions very real-time. It can't be something that was done uh, early in the morning and that lasts for the whole day. So how do we, how do we work with this um, explosion of data? Before I, I answer that question, let me tell you about Amazon.com. Um, Amazon.com was in one company in 2000, in one country in 2000. We had only 73 uh, fulfillment centers. It took us 18 hours to move a package through the fulfillment center. In 2022, we have, we have 100, 185 plus fulfillment centers. We process 45 plus million requests per second. Uh, we have uh, 100 million automated ordering plans. We have 20,000 transportation trailers. The volume grew and it took us, it now takes us only two hours to process a parcel through the fulfillment center. How did we do that? 
We, we grew the scale of, um, of our um, uh, operations. We got a ton more data. We leverage huge IoT robotics um, um, everywhere. And yet, we were able to take less time to manage and, and, and interpret the data. And that we did by end-to-end -end collaboration. We leverage a whole lot of AI ML to make decisions out of the data, to run analytics out of the data. Um, and, and we uh, have governance around our data. We have to ensure that that data is secure, it's transparent, it's well-governed, and it is uh, managed properly. So, this is how AWS does that. And this is how what our learnings from Amazon.com, we have uh, made that into services that we now uh, provide to our customers. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, that's the process data flows through. It gets ingested through a multiple so a set of sources. It gets transformed, harmonized, so that data can be connected, various pieces of data coming from different sources. We leverage AI, ML to understand the data, to interpret the data. We leverage historical data to be able to make decisions. We build insights, recommendations, and then we, we reiterate that AI, ML model to make it better based on um, uh, our understanding and learnings till it becomes a business strategy. And all that is done within the framework of what AWS provides you of quality and integrity of data, governance. We give you transparency of how your data flows through the systems. Sven was talking about data coming in and out and in and out. That's the transparency we provide you. We ensure that there is security as the data goes through multiple systems, multiple personas, multiple countries and continents, uh, compliance to the different regulations around the data, cybersecurity, uh, ethical usage of AI models. We build models, but we also enable you as a customer to ensure that there is ethical usage of that data. And last but not the least, we don't just come in and help you manage the data, provide you the, the framework. We train you. We ensure that as we walk away, you have the uh, knowledge to be able to manage and govern the data for your business going forward. And we have a lot of success with a lot of customers. Some of these customers you probably know. Um, there are a lot more customers that I could not put on this particular slide. Uh, DTDC is the parcel and courier company in India. They wanted to launch a new mobile app. And they wanted to track, end-to-end -end track, their first mile and the last mile which again caused an explosion of data. And they came to us to ask us for our help in, in enabling that. We've worked with Purolator for a huge volume of uh, data. Uh, you read the other uh, partners. We worked with US Post when COVID hit. And within two days, we built them a website for ordering COVID vaccines and delivering COVID vaccines within two days. 54 million COVID vaccines. So we have these frameworks that we enable our customers to um, track the data and, and enable their digital uh, transformation. So my request to you, I still have three more minutes. My request to you is if you have any questions, if you as a customer would like to explore um, use cases or work with AWS to figure out um, uh, how you enable your digital transformation. Work with us. My contact name is over there. Uh, I have colleagues in the audience that can help you as well. The way we work with you is we enable you. We work with you. We enable you to think big, to build your transformational roadmap. And then we walk backwards from it to build use cases, to build the steps that will let you go to the uh, roadmap or the goal. And then we, 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 once we prove success, we, we make that into a flywheel to um, grow from there. That's all. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Brody, collecting data, administering data, processing data, this all creates a lot of uncertainty. 
Isn't that also an opportunity maybe for the posts that are leaders in trust? Uh, absolutely. What I thought I'd start with is just a few slides on what's going on in the industry uh, from our future of post research that we do every year. What you can see here is what's happened in the last, uh, last two years from a revenue and profitability standpoint. One of the things that we're finding is that there's a lot of additional ambiguity in the industry right now as postal operators are working through the sizable changes that occurred on the uh, mail side with mail volume declines and on the parcel side with uh, parcel volume growth. And these networks are right sizing. What you see on the revenue side is that there a, was a shift from positive to neutral. And this data comes from the, right at the beginning of this year, Q4 of last year, Q1 of this year, we saw a marked slowdown in parcel volumes, declines in most geographies that we look at. And so that's that transition that you see of revenue from uh, positive revenue the previous year to neutral. It's a little different on the profitability side. What you see is that it shifts from positive to negative on the profitability side as parcel volume slowed down and the networks struggled to right size to catch up with that adjustment in volumes. What we found as this year has progressed is that volumes have stabilized and have come back in a few geographies. So we're seeing flat to slightly down in most geographies with a few exceptions where we're seeing slightly positive parcel volumes. The other thing that we're finding is on the mail volume side, mail volume decline is about 200 basis points higher than it was pre-pandemic in most of the geographies that we study. So if you were at 5% pre-pandemic, you're at 7% mail volume decline now. What all that's doing is creating headwinds in the industry and some additional instability in postal organizations as they struggle to right-size their networks and return to profitability. When we ask the question of what's the, what's the biggest impact happening in, the, in your uh, business today, what you'll find is that if you go back a couple years, the big winner is kind of right in the middle there, which was increased parcel volumes creating capacity challenges. Capacity challenge was the challenge during the pandemic. What you see is that it's gone back to pre-pandemic norms and mail volume declines has become the biggest impact that postal organizations are dealing with today. What I find interesting is that you can see a split 50-50, really. Half of the posts are saying that falling volumes are creating revenue challenges, and the other half of the posts are saying that they still have capacity challenges. This is the first time we've seen this level of variation in the industry, where, it, where we're, it's hard to point to a global trend. It's very regional. Uh, Southeast Asia, for example, volumes falling fairly dramatically. Some of the places in Europe that we're, that we're looking at, volumes are climbing slightly. So it's a, 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 a still a very uh, widely varying st uh, situation, and it really depends on your geography. The other two that I want to spend just a little bit of time on are right at the, uh, at the bottom. Increased same-day delivery, you got a, a, a low response rate, but continues to be a high priority as we talk with retailers, and then returns got an even lower rating. Returns continue to grow in every geography that we're studying. Returns continue to be an important element of the e-commerce ecosystem, and post organizations continue to be the organizations that should dominate in this space and are paying, in my opinion, too little attention to the role that they should be playing in the return space. And this, uh, this chart kind of plays that out. So moving then uh, into the kind of the trust topic, what you find when we ask where post organizations see opportunity, it's in trust areas. Government services, prescription uh, drug delivery, financial services and identity are four areas that are ranked well as far as where they see potential growth. It doesn't compare to what we're seeing on e-commerce. E-commerce continues to be the big growth driver. But you see that there's a 
play there in, in the middle of this data here of where the trust that a post can bring adds, uh, adds value to the sorts of transactions that they be, can, be, can, uh, can be providing. And the one I want to focus on next is identity. If you look at what's happening with fraud, the pandemic radically accelerated uh, challenges with fraud. And you can see some of the statistics here. But it's something that needs to be addressed. And we're seeing banks and e-commerce organizations in particular wanting to have different solutions out in the market. One of the important things to addressing fraud is putting a human with the home, a person to a place. And that's not an easy thing to do. As we've looked at solutions that are out in the market, most of them have challenges. But Pulse organizations are extremely well suited to be able to do this. Uh, analysis that we did a few years ago off the OCR solution that Escher offers found that we could read the person and address data off the mail piece and get a, a database of the people and places in a country that was far more robust than what anybody else would be able to develop. Passively gathering this human to home association off of the off of the processing that you're already doing the mail and parcels that are moving through your networks. You'll see patterns in that data that nobody else can see. You'll see identities in that data that nobody else can see. And as you pull that data in passively, then you can you can then layer on an active association of that data, right? An additional level of verif verification. As you look at who's talking about being able to use this, it's certainly the e-commerce companies, but human to home is important for many of the programs that government organizations offer. The social welfare programs, voting, uh, school districting are some of the, the important where it's, you've got to have that right association. The use of that mail stream to passively gather that association uh, the, the data that you're already gathering, and then the uh, additional validation that you could layer onto that would provide a solution in the market that doesn't exist anywhere today and is in high demand as we talk with these government and e-commerce uh, uh, e uh, entities. Another area where postal organizations, I think, should be playing a bigger role from a trust and security standpoint is in financial services. As you look at what's happening in the banking industry today and the reduction in the physical footprint, one of the things that we're finding is that posts are well suited to fill that void. And post organizations that are launching these new financial products, you can see here the types of products that they're offering, are benefiting from that change in the dynamic, that change in what's happening in the physical footprint of places where you can get cash. Escher is a, is a uh, um, tech company at its heart, a logistics tech company. And because we work with postal organizations broadly, we're often approached by fintech organizations and they have a, a simple proposition. They say there are times, occasional times, when we need to be able to get cash into people's hands or cash out of hand, uh, people's hands, right? Grandma wants to give $100 uh, to each of her grandkids. They need fractional physical. And Pulse organizations are the prime organizations to be able to offer that fractional physical to a fintech. Again, with leveraging the trust and security that they offer with the brand and proximity that they have. With that, you can see the QR code here. If you want to get the, the full report, if you just scan that QR code, it'll allow you to enter your email address. We'll send you the report, and then we'll send you the updates as they're available. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Brody. Um, Lati, you're the next one. And I mean, transferring the traditional physical trust and security that most postal operators have, but to a digital one is not so easy. So how can the UPU help in that respect? Yeah, so thank you very much, Bernard. So my name is Lati Matata. I work at the International Bureau. Uh, I am the director of the Postal Technology Center. So to answer Bernard's question, uh, I just have one slide. I'll try to make it easy. Um, the way to approach this, the way I'd like to approach this is in a holistic view. So each one of these uh, points here, of course, are very detailed. They touch 
very much on all the topics that uh, my fellow panelists have talked about. So I just want to go through each one of them, saying how they strengthen uh, our sectors in terms of uh, digital trust and security, of course, building on the trust that we already have from a physical point of view. So starting with standards, uh, we have our UPU Acts treaties. Uh, they are specific uh, regulations and articles uh, in our convention. That means they are binding on the members uh, related to the handling of personal data. Uh, similarly, the International Bureau has got some obligations in terms of handling the data uh, that we use on behalf of the postal operators. Um, to achieve this, of course, we have to take uh, the best practices. Uh, we don't, uh, let's say, as an intergovernmental organization, don't follow any national laws. We try to apply, let's say, ISO standards, so similar intergovernmental standards. So ISO standards are applied. We always um, use these standards to ensure that we are following best practices in handling uh, data. Across the UN system too, there are efforts to harmonize uh, practices of handling data, securing information. So standards basically is a heart and key of what we do and what we provide to our members. Now, we go to the second point on solutions, and, and this one I must say I can talk on forever because this is my core business. Um, the, the acronyms you see there, for those of you who don't know, are the UPU technology uh, that we deliver to our postal operators to help them essentially fulfill the acts and basically do the business that they know very well. They cover all the dimensions, logistics, financial services, uh, customs handling, and postal payments. So I was happy to see many orders uh, listed there. Now, these solutions, uh, I'm very, very pleased to say, are heavily and widely de deployed. So IPS, for example, is our flagship product. It's used by 196 postal operators, including PostNL, since we're here. They committed back in 2008 to use IPS, have invested heavily into it. It's part of their core international mail processing. And all their investment has gone into the product and been made available to all the rest of the postal operators. So this sort of cooperative model has worked well for us as the UPU. Similar to CDS, it is used by, uh, it's for customs handling. It is used by 136 postal operators. DPS is, uh, we're very creative when we have our names. DPS means domestic postal system. And it's all about a solution for the domestic market. Understanding our core business is international. The network nevertheless has to go through your national territory. So we were asked by our members to build a domestic solution. UPYP is basically our new platform for uh, instant payment. Now, because of this heavy deployment, we are now starting to see ourselves as a platform. A platform combining all these solutions to help our operators to um, do all the postal business uh, in synchronicity all at once. Now, what that means is the next uh, slide there, the next point, partnerships. We do realize that our postal operators uh, don't work in a vacuum. They work a lot with the private sector. We are very interested in making sure this technology seamlessly integrates with the solutions from uh, our, their partners and our partners. So what we're doing here is we have a clear interoperability strategy. Uh, we have exposed in public the APIs of all these solutions. And now we are going forward with the next level. We want to certify these solutions uh, and anybody who is in the commercial space and they want to integrate with these solutions, they will receive uh, a certification for, from us. Now what this means for them, and I hope there are more uh, private operators here, is that now you will get a stamp from the UPU saying you are certified and you can use this to access this large deployment footprint that I've just spoken about. Going down to postal data, I think you know all about that massive amounts of data. The point I want to make here is um, what is happening in the EAD space, electronic advanced data. What is happening here is the part of trust is getting stronger because before a postal item can leave the origin country, it has to have been accepted by the customs authority in the destination country, including transit because of the ICS2 release to situation. What does that mean? We are strengthening the trust 
we are strengthening the security of postal items moving through the supply chain. Now, with all that data, we are also working on advanced analytics. So quality of service has always been a key uh, part of the work we're doing. There are very many extensive programs to analyze the data, provide reports, and help our operators improve. The last point, I, I need to mention it just like everybody else, uh, AI, uh, machine learning, these are things that we are doing. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, not later than three weeks ago, we added to our global track and trace solution uh, the ability to have a predictive uh, delivery date. Now, this is very big for us. We work on a national scale, uh, international scale. So all our small posts, so about 64 of them have integrated our global track and trace solution into the UPO website, into their corporate websites, are now able to offer their customers a predictive date of delivery, something I would say mostly the advanced posts do. I'm running out of time. I'll be quick. Now, centralizing uh, the interconnection between us and any private operator is networks. We have our platform for exchange of data called PostNet. We're working very closely with uh, carriers first and customs authorities to make sure that data is moved seamlessly, securely between the postal operators and airlines. So again, this is a core central part of the work we're doing. Finally, something that is new, and I refer to some of the, the questions raised yesterday, I kept quiet about it, is we have, as the UPU realized long time ago, that securing the online space is critical. So we are the only UN organization uh, across the entire UN system that actually has a sponsored top level domain uh, in place. And we did this back in 2012. It has not moved, maybe it was not its time, but I'm very pleased to say now it's its time. I think we all recognize we need to secure ourselves. And we are working now to open it up, if I may use that expression, and make it available more to the private postal sector and make it easier for our own designated postal operators to build services. So this is all about frameworks of having, uh, first of all, security best practices of your website, of your e-commerce site, but it's also a brand. Just like uh, your customers appreciate and, and, and uh, understand your physical presence since 1874, what we want to do with the dot .post domain is achieve the same online. So if you close your eyes for a bit, you imagine Amazon.com, we can say Amazon.post. If you go right now to postnl.post, there is a page. They are partners of this. They have done this right from the beginning. We have ethio.post, which has committed its entire online strategy to using the .post domain. So we are starting to accelerate on this end, and I'm sure this will really strengthen our, our, our let's say, our ability to, um, to provide trust and security for the postal sector. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. I look into the audience whether there are already some questions. Just think about your questions whenever you're ready. Uh, just raise your hands, please. Um, we, we, we have seen so many new technologies lately popping up. I mean, I mean, IoT, okay, many posts are working in that area already in one way or another. You have AI, of course, so many use cases. You have blockchain, so many, many new technologies that are, that, that are appearing um, and are already here already. But how do they impact the way we perceive and can establish trust and security? Who wants to start, maybe? Who, who has an answer to that? I think that, uh, <clears throat> that we need to also... Trust and security means that you, you're comfortable with the process. And, uh, and as we see technology advance, we are seeing a bit widening gap between the older generation and younger generation. As we uh, go forward with the AI solutions and uh, we come up with all of these clever ways how to deliver the parcels, then actually we see that the trust of elder generation in the post in the light of these uh, innovations and developments decrease. And it, it decreases because they don't understand what is being offered, what, what is being done. And I think that this is one of those things that we need to, we need to be on that edge, we need to keep uh, keep developing, advancing, so to make sure that we cater for the future and, and we, we come up with state-of-the-art solutions. But we also need to remember that Boost has to serve all of them, 
that means from, from young to old, and we also need to make sure that we, we don't leave behind some of the generations as we, as we uh, proceed on this path. If I may add to that, um, so we often, when we say trust and security, we often think that there is a, a, a tool that will protect the data, right? But trust and security in data also means quality of the data, data coming from so many different places. Is that good data? Is that harmonized and cleansed so that something can be made out of that data? So as, as, as the postal uh, operators start moving towards their digital transformation, as they engage in bringing in more and more uh, different sources of data, what will be very important in, 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 in being able to do something with it is in getting that data, in interpreting that data, in building models or, or leveraging AI ML to, to give us guidance and, and um, recommendations from that data, and then be able to take action around it. Um, so that's to, uh, I wanted to call out that sometimes we always think that Trust and security in data means I, 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 can, I can box it into, into something and I can protect the data. Trust and security in data also means good data, good quality data coming from a whole bunch of sources. As I reflect on it a little bit, it'd be interesting to do a poll. You know, with these new technologies that are coming out, uh, who feels their data and uh, identity is more secure and who feels that it's less my sense is that everybody would say less and part of the challenge is the technologies that protect that data or keep the uh, the integrity of that data uh, are lagging i think there's more attention needed there uh, if i look at you know one of the things that uh, we do at Escher is Escher, the, the, our retail solution is built on a distributed ledger uh, technology, uh, which means we've never lost a transaction. It's never been breached. It's never, uh, we never lost one. It operates offline. So if the network goes down, it, it's it, it, all, all, all this goodness. Um, how do you take a technology like that and start using it in different functions to add the security and, and trust, uh, and uh, and I love what Dipti talked about of kind of that it's more than just kind of protecting the data, but it's making it real. The last thing I'll say on that is, you know, if you, if you think about where AI is headed, often the answer you get is counterintuitive, and I wonder how many times that's because the data is bad. <laughs> um, even more important there when you're going to start putting trust in the answer to have trust in the data. Mm. Uh, Bernard, maybe a different take on it, because you said the perception on technology. What we see is, uh, of course, demands from all other places to do something, and we always try to find the least common denominator to actually give a solution that could work in as many different environments. So the key word I'd use is simplicity. Uh, I, th I saw it was spoken about very much yesterday, customer experience, which for me is simplicity. Is the solution helping the customer do what it used to do simpler? And if they have that, then behind you can have very, very expensive and advanced uh, AI. You can have very, very expensive solutions. Uh, but what happens is a repeat use, and that needs simplicity. So that's what we try, at least uh, from, uh, from what we do at the International Bureau, is give simple solutions. Thank you. So that the members can easily adopt and implement them. Now, you said something. You have various types of people. I mean, there, there is a part of the society that loves and embraces new technologies. So no question with regard to that. Even though they might perceive this as, okay, there is maybe... They, 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 they think more of their data is going somewhere, so it's not really so good, but still they embrace it. But then you have parts of the society where it's not at all this. I mean, uh, you, you said, I mean, there are people that um, 
that cannot really deal with new technologies, but how do you bring them along? Because I mean, they are an opportunity, those new technologies. You, 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 you implement them, you deploy them, but in the end of the day, if there is a certain part of your population which trusts you less, I mean, that can't be good either. How do you deal with that? That's a really good question. Like, <clears throat> when, when we think about the society, we always have hipsters. So Omniva was the first postal operator in the world to implement automatic puzzle machines in 2010. So we were one of, uh, one of those pioneers who started to try to, to make a change. And we saw that in the first three to four years time, we only had the hipsters. Only the ones who wanted to look cool, even though they didn't, uh, at that time the functionality wasn't what it is today. Then came the mass market. And then the lacquers only came around during the COVID and they would have never came along, but COVID basically pushed them that uh, to make, uh, make to use that. And, and they all of a sudden they figured it out. But, but what I mean is that we, as we go towards the AI and, and uh, obviously that is the way, way to go forward, we still need to make sure that we cover all of the needs. At some moment in Omniva, we thought that the only solution out there is the puzzle, automated puzzle machine. It's convenient, it's easy, which it's just about spread, how much we can put, put around there. But when we talk about the trust and security in the service, then the, we, all of a sudden we start getting, what about the disabled, what about the blind, what about the people who cannot, who cannot use it, or the people uh, who actually want to use cash because they don't have uh, uh, any of the credit cards and they want to have the customs declared items from China in the IOSS process set up uh, in, in cash. So you have to, even though the mainstream is going to develop there, you cannot ignore the, uh, the latter part. And that's, I think, one of the challenges of UPU wider. That's why I don't envy Letty that, that UPU has to cater for the needs of Switzerland and Estonia, and at the same time, uh, someone in, in Africa in a civil war or, or et cetera, so that the system is, is the same. And that is, I think, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges, how to keep these both sides intact and both feel that they, get, they have a trust and security in the service they're getting. Mm -hmm. So within AWS, Amazon, we have a little bit different perspective. As our business has been growing, <clears throat> we have been leveraging cutting edge technology to support our business instead of bringing in humans. <clears throat> Sorry for that. So, our, and within AWS, what we do is we take that uh, cutting edge technology and make it available to our customers. So what we want to within AWS do is, yes, there are, there are parts of the society that is not as open to leveraging the cutting edge technologies, but our goal is to show you the art of the possible. And, and our goal is to, or our hope is that we make it habit forming for you. Till, till some time back, I used to not order my food on Uber Eats. Today, I do not want to go to a restaurant unless I'm going with friends. I order my food on Uber Eats. That has become hob habit forming. I did not know that food could be ordered on Uber Eats, but I know that now. So that's, that's, what, that's the perception we bring is we leverage cutting edge technology. We make it simple, uh, using Lati's words. We make it simple and then we work with our customers to make that habit forming, show them what can be done with technology. Do you have something to add? Brody? Go for it. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so I, I think we should not forget, uh, at least when I speak about uh, the postal sector, I speak about the, the UPU itself. We have these stats that we, we get on a yearly basis on the number of postal employees. And, and this is, uh, I think the last one is 5.3 million, if we put all the postal staff. Majority of them are the, the posties, the operational people. And they are physically moving uh, the mail. They want uh, these processes to be simple when they're interacting with technology same, they, they want it to be simple. Now, asking them to forego uh, certain or use more complex uh, technology is a no-go. So uh, we, we do hear a lot of complaints on how difficult it is to, to change things, the regulations in the UPU. It's for the simple reason that the base operations uh, don't change. If there's anything that touches that, uh, you could have a disjointed network or basically the mail will not move smoothly between uh, Michigan and somewhere in the middle of the Sahara. It will not happen. Uh, 
So what we try to do is introduce, uh, I would say, using your word, uh, using your name of a company, an omni solution. It is possible to do it this way, but you still have the option to print a paper, you still have an option to print a label, you still have an option, uh, and so on and so forth. It is uh, difficult, it is painful, but in this way we are able still to maintain this homogeneity of the entire network. So it's basically an omni, uh, omni solution approach to your question. Thank you. Okay, this reflects also on, I mean, this morning we had a discussion and, um, and it was around also cultural, regional differences in a sense of how you perceive trust and how you perceive security. And, um, and I mean, you just mentioned that uh, the UPU systems, they work in Switzerland and Estonia, but as well in some other regions, developing regions where you don't have the same technology or maybe even a civil war. So where uh, the situation is completely different. So exactly one size doesn't fit all, but how do you cater with that? How can you deal with that one size doesn't fit all? You have a world with so many differences, with so many different perceptions and expectations towards trust and security. How, how, how can you manage that in a global network? And, and this, this comes back to what, what I said in my presentation, that my, my expectations towards UPU perhaps is that, that it's not so much about, uh, UPU's main role in my view is not to distribute about the pricing, which is usually the most, most biggest issue. If someone has large volumes, you can make a bilateral agreement. But it's more about the standards, which also uh, you brought up in the presentation. But I, I would also like you, you to look into the standards more into also the commercial field. What I said that, for example, if we had one API integration, because I mean, us in Omniva, we have 100 plus integrations with different partners, each of them with different completely setup. However, the events behind them, all the same made available for pickup, made the pickup, customs clearance, arrival to the hub, etc. We all know all of these events. Why does it mean that we have to make <laughs> hundreds of integrations, etc.? So if we were able to standardize, the same as that phones are all different, but we have certain standards. We have inside EU that the roaming package is the same. You have the Type-C charging network, etc. So we should be looking towards standardizing the things which doesn't need necessarily the competition and then keep the competition on the pricing outside of that scope. And this, this is what I see because that will enable us to do the trust and security part. When Europe implemented the IOSS uh, solution, we, uh, we tried several service providers on how to implement HS codes automatically, machine learning, etc. But if the input there is red, then machine cannot tell you what is inside because the red is not an item. So it's all about making sure that the chain of data remains intact. That's right. There's a risk I might speak a lot, Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how we're trying to, let's say, strengthen the trust um, is actually seeing, uh, let's say, if I may use the word, take a leadership role, not by me per se, I would say by our director general, but also my fellow directors, because um, it is recognized that the UPU, of course, as an intergovernmental uh, organization, has a neutral position. We take a neutral position. Therefore, if we use our presence or our logo or our identification and say, this is something that is um, vetted by the UPU, it is in conformance with the standards of the UPU, we can, you can use that to leverage on the trust of the customer. And that's why I, I spoke briefly on this tech cert. It's a technical certification because we think it is valuable for the commercial sector to receive this and help them to access new markets or at least to lower the barrier of integration. So it's, it's all about, let's say, identity uh, and uh, leveraging on, let's say, our neutral position. Thank you. If I may add to it, yeah, uh, that's where uh, vendors like us can work with you, right? Because while we understand that there is different requirements for, for everybody, different countries, different organizations, there has to be some basic infrastructural standardization that needs to be done to make the volume uh, uh, be available, right? And beyond that, Wherever there are differentiators for each of the individual requirements, then we work with to ensure we, we configure and, and deliver to that. But there has to be that base 
um, standardization that we, we can work with you. So, I mean, the Amazon is part of the consultative committee, so as a member of the uh, UPU today, we can say of the wider UPU. So, this is a concrete expectation that you have Correct. with your involvement within the UPU system to say to drive those standards, to, to drive these common approaches to, for example, trust and security in a, in a global network, in a global postal ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe also, Brody, you want something to add to these yeah, points? I, I mean, to your original question of kind of standardization, I'm uncertain that's an attainable or even uh, advisable goal uh, in you know, in the where we're at today. If you go back a hundred years, was it uh, you could? Uh, what was the statement from Ford? You could get a Ford in any color you wanted as long as it was black. <laughs> um, how would that play today? <laughs> Uh, I, uh, uh, <laughs> to this personalization concept, I uh, showed up at a hotel the other day and they had a Coke sitting on the table that had my name on it. And uh, I was intrigued by this. So I went and asked the manager, I'm like, all right, that, that was nice, right? Coke with, had my name printed on it. Why'd you pick Coke? And uh, they said, because the, Analytics say that that's your favorite drink. Uh, and uh, if anybody on my team knows, if you know, we go to dinner, I'm going to order a Coke. Um, that's the sort of personalization that we're coming to expect. And it requires the right data that's clean. And there's standards that have to be applied to that. But I don't know that this kind of one-size-fits-all is ever going to fly in the world again. So there, there is kind of... There's standards that enable interoperability, and that's key. And that, as I think, is where the UPU has done a great job and probably can do more. Uh, at dinner last night, Charles was talking about how, you know, if, if posts work together, they would have the best network in the world. But that's been a goal for a long time, and for whatever reason, barriers keep getting in the way. That's, that's what's needed, right, is that you're, you're never going to make... Uh, Swiss Post and uh, Estonia and Namibia all work the same, but if you can get the standards that enable the interoperability, then you've got trust between the organizations and, and then you get a different value proposition. And I think that's a, a better objective than uh, make it all common, right? Make it all the same. I don't think we'll get there. Be before we, um, you answer maybe to his question, so, um, once you were told in the hotel that it's your favorite drink and that's why it was there, how did you feel? Did you feel now trust I mean, I was or? I freaked out by it. No, uh, that's what I thought. I, 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 and I did not tell them that. They had mm -hmm. figured it out somehow. I have no idea how. Uh, and, and so my first reaction was, wow, that's personalization. And my second reaction was, wow, what else do they know about me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what else do they know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Any questions from the audience now? Nobody? It's just you're all happy with what it is and they've all been so very clear. Please, Lati, yes. Uh, the, the, there is, uh, the world is not flat, if I may use that expression. And a, a very good uh, demonstration of that is a dressing system. Um, each country, <laughs> each village uh, might have its own way of reaching uh, that citizen. So, so what we face at the UPU, of course, we try to standardize, we have an S42 standard, try to bring some harmony, but it is an attempt, it is not a success. Um, so when we build systems, or at least when we try and find solutions, uh, as I said, we, we find the least common denominator, but acknowledge that the world is not flat, addressing is a huge, huge undertaking, it changes every day, uh, people move around a lot, there are some excellent solutions in terms of identity management that we like to, to work on together. Uh, and I, I enjoyed the fact that Esha is looking at identity management um, to help uh, the posts identify the customers wherever they are in the world. Again, privacy issues concern, uh, aside, um, if we can help the customer feel more comfortable, uh, not feel that they have been watched, but also feel that they can be reached um, it would be very, very good from the trust uh, point of view. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. 
Um, let's let's move maybe to e-commerce, and uh, I mean, I mean, because this is really the area where everybody is doing something. Uh, I mean, as an individual, everybody is buying now and then or very often something on the internet. You share your data, and that is very common. And uh, the data, again, is shared, of course, with whoever does the delivery, the logistics behind it, so a postal operator, maybe, hopefully. And, uh, and so, and so all, 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 all these kind of data questions create a lot of concern, of course. So there's the concern of a lot of people still out there, okay, what are they doing? many many stakeholders are involved what are they doing with my data and of course then you have also brands behind it and others that want to keep a good reputation so how can e-commerce platforms how can carriers and together uh, mitigate those concerns of uh, e-commerce shoppers I, I think that you what you mean mostly is uh, like how do they avoid data breaches or how do you or how do you yes how do we avoid data breaches but also how do you how do you make people feel safe so I think it's both <clears throat> I think it's the we we are developing and and delivering uh, we're one of the leaders in the last mile deliveries into Central Asia so we we have positioned ourselves there and some of the countries there are quite quite challenging and and the challenge comes from not from the last mile part people of Kyrgyzstan trust Kyrgyz Post because that's that's their pro provider however someone from Amazon might not have the same, same sense of security towards, uh, towards a lo local provider there. Uh, and this is where we as, as Omniva come in, in terms of the assurance and setting and, and basically saying that yes, we provide our assurance that they are up to the standard that data doesn't, doesn't leak. But, but obviously the countries are very different and also the amount of data, for example, some of the countries in order to do the customs clearance, you need to also list down your parents, you need to list down where your parents live, you need to list down their birth years, addresses, etc., their last year's incomes, etc. So there is a lot of uh, input which might seem normal in that country because they're working in that ecosystem which is very strange for anyone coming from US or, or Europe for that matter. So the challenge, uh, challenge is to have that trust for the local regulation to that, uh, that we need to comply with the local regulation. That's also been one of the biggest hindrances of large e-coms going into developing markets. And, and obviously we, we work with the local regulators to try to ease the restrictions, but the aim why they're doing that, and we've been talking with local customs is that to minimize the customs fraud and that goes back to this trust and security and that's why I, I mentioned before that if we would have one universal standard it would be very difficult for anyone to ignore it and say no we don't provide it because if they actually had a chance to receive the actual value of transaction they wouldn't care for all of that the rest of that but uh, but it, it is about the trust and security and I think that, that it, at the moment it, you're working on that case by case basis, but we do need a universal solution at certain stage. Uh, so Brody had shared in his slide, right? Um, mail business is going down, e-commerce business is going up. More of more of us are ordering stuff, and and more of a, more of us have requirements of collecting a whole bunch of data and and giving visibility to it which does mean that a lot of data is coming in, um, which does mean, agree with you, there has to be some sort of a standardization. And I don't mean standardization from the f per fact of that everybody has to use the same data, but there has to be some standardization to be able to have that trust and security. But beyond that, there, is, there are expectations, there is data and and what we within AWS and Amazon are doing is we are building that customer's trust in the data by leveraging technology, by leveraging some of these, um, if, if I may say one of the technologies is AI ML, it could be IoT, it could be robotics, bringing in technology and showing to the customers that there is security governance around those technologies. They are not going astray, pulling in the data and sharing it with everybody, right? So we, we, we work with our customers in each of these countries, in each of these markets, to be able to leverage the tools and services we have 
to build that customer trust around the data because the reality is each of the customers that we work with have customers that have absolutely increasing, exploding needs for leveraging that data. So, Bernard, I can give a very simple example. Uh, I live in Switzerland, and I must tell you when it comes to e-commerce, I'm more comfortable dealing with Swiss Post uh, to buying something from their website because I know Swiss Post. They, they come to my door every day. Um, however, if I was to go to, uh, not pointing figures, uh, Burkina Faso Post, um, I would not be so comfortable ordering something to come to me for the fact that it's a different country. I don't know that post. So, so at the UPU, I mean, I think Nermin mentioned it briefly, the ambition to have a global uh, e-commerce site really like to work with you on this to find a commonality to interconnect e-commerce sites. This is one ambition we had uh, five years ago and we, we, we try to work on this to interconnect. Uh, it doesn't matter, commercial, postal, but basically have the customer experience for international items become local. That was the key. So same concept. I'm now dealing with Swiss Post. I live in Switzerland. But on the Swiss Post website are products from Burkina Faso that I want. And then I just have to deal with uh, Swiss Post. Swiss Post has to deal with Burkina Faso Post, and that's their problem. They just have to make it very, very good for me. So this is uh, one direction uh, we would really like to, to work, especially with the commercial sector, to, to enable. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I look again at the audience, if there is somebody. Um, we have been talking about all these new technologies, but, but not concretely about the technologies. What are possible technologies that provide opportunities to create more trust and security in our systems? And how could they do that? Do you have any opinions on that? Something that uh, Sven had in his uh, presentation about using blockchain or, or, or the broader distributed ledger, ledger technologies to better protect and uh, uh, secure the data, I think is, I, I, there's, there's got to be more that's done there, the, the, or more to come there, as I look at the increasing sophistication of the hacking capabilities. I, I think we'll see more of that technology uh, adopted just to protect the data. There's obviously things that could be done uh, kind of white hat AI sorts of things to combat the black hat AI sorts of things uh, that are going on out there. I, um, I worry that the investment profile is backward there, uh, that uh, it's easier to steal something than protect it. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's where the money is going. Uh, at, at the end of the day, the... Um, the, the challenge is always going to be the pace at which these technologies are evolving and, and the investment that's needed to keep pace with the protection it has got to be more commonly shared. Mm -hmm. uh, there's got to be uh, kind of joint investment. I think this is something UPU could probably help with as well. Uh, if I may add to that, uh, in, in, in my perspective, I think governance and transparency, in addition to blockchain kind of technology, right? In a way, blockchain does provide the governance and transparency to the data. There's data coming in from various sources. How do we provide um, access control? How do we provide the transparency to get, ensure that our customers trust where the data is going? Uh, one more thing that I'll bring up is uh, a lot of us have started using chat GPT. So Gen AI is, is, is being talked uh, at, at every boardroom. And Gen AI has the perspective of, 
you know, we all love Gen AI, but we don't know how data is protected because it has access to anything and everything. So that the next set of investments in, in terms of building security and trust will be how these chatbots, when they go and they pull perceptions and, and recommendations from a huge volume of data, how is that controlled? How do we protect that when I ask ChatGPT or any other uh, Gen AI tool uh, a question, it doesn't go into the World Wide Web and pull everything out. It goes to a set of protected environment from which it pulls out that uh, data. Why I mentioned before this uh, either blockchain solution or, or standardization, just for, for some of you who, who don't know. so. When we're dealing with 20 million parcels from China to, to Europe, for example, at this stage, the parcel is created in China. When they're putting it on an airplane, there is still a paper cargo manifest, what is on there, pretty detailed level on what are the items, what are the HS codes, what are the values. Then it's brought over to Europe, then it's trucked, and the truck driver gets the same manifest, then et cetera. So you need to make sure that that truck driver doesn't get all the info, that the airline who's transporting for five different competitors doesn't get all of that data. So you block something out. And now when we finally get that uh, <laughs> manifest, manifested data, then actually, what is actually on the manifest of the truck driver, what is sent to us, what they were supposed to send, and what the airline said that was on the plane, none of them match. And that's the, the only way how to make it match is to make sure that we're actually reading the same data, not the different versions of the Excel, which were at a certain moment, but actually we're going back to the same ultimate ledger and looking at the same data, same item, and we know where that specific item, item is at that stage. And we're not there, why? because we still have regulations where airlines need to, for redundancy purposes, need to have two sets of papers, one electronic, one paper, the truck drivers need to have something in hand because if the police, etc. And because of the ecosystem which doesn't support this, we're still in the situation that because of that, we receive in a year somewhere around 100,000 parcels which we actually have no manifested data, and we're missing another 100,000 <laughs> items, which we have the data, but we <laughs> and, and I don't see any other way to solve it than we actually have the same data, and we just can blur out certain fields to send, but we're not cutting it, but we're keeping the same one, and that's where the blockchain actually comes in. But I, I'm not saying that that's the only option. But the challenge from a last mile delivery operator, especially for cross-border, is huge and the pain is every day. And it's not just us, but across the board. Do you want to react to that as well? Uh, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll use the word cloudification. Uh, um, uh, and, and to um, Sven's point, um, consolidation of data is something that we've heard a lot about. And also use the word uh, specialization. Uh, why I say this is uh, at the International Bureau, um, we are uh, receiving a lot of alerts, a lot of reports of uh, our poor postal operators getting attacked and hacked and basically taken out of business. And, and to that point, these days, a postal item cannot move if there is no data that has been captured and sent. So basically, business stops. So, so uh, our response to this, uh, to, to Brody's point, is, is to specialize, uh, store the data in places where the people know how to handle this. So our, our standard, uh, let's say, cloud providers, Microsoft, Amazon, AWS, because they know how to protect data. And, and in so doing, we also help with the consolidation part. So that means looking up and getting information to get the exact uh, data you need, not all of it, um, is possible. So we're bringing all the data in one place, but making sure it is kept in the most secure place possible. That for me is, is critical. And then with that comes the next point on reliability. Um, that you are guaranteed when you look up this data uh, anywhere in the world, as long as you have an internet access, you will get the answer you're looking for. And this again requires uh, real cloudification, expertise, a lot of investment, but it is for me worth it to protect us. From, from what is happening bad in the world today with regards to, to hacking. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, you have brought up also 
a few examples how blockchain can help in that respect. Now we have been talking about blockchain, I think for a couple of years already, right? And when you look around how many solutions you see of blockchains developed in or for the postal industry or logistics in general, then you just come to the conclusion of saying, well, something's wrong here. I mean, everybody's saying about those amazing use cases, smart contracts and you name it and the security that comes with it, but nobody really does a lot about it at the moment. So where do you see the future really of blockchain? Will there be a future of blockchain? And when will there be maybe a breakthrough finally that we can see deployed either in UPU systems or within postal operators or for other cross-border transactions? So what's the future? Is there a future? And when can we expect this future? That's a really, really good one. I, I, like from Omniverse perspective, we always said that automated parcel machine is the future and then, then actually the future came and, and it became a reality. And then in the mid uh, uh, 2015, somewhere around that, everyone started saying that the next bre uh, breakthrough in last mile is going to be drones. We're going to see drone deliveries, everything dropped off. And when 2023, <laughs> and I haven't seen anyone making it work. And, uh, <laughs> Not on a large scale, on uh, it's it's not yet there from a from a real like to being able to have anyone doing ninety percent of deliveries or something like that, and and you, you it has for niche niche missions, and that's the same like with the blockchain that uh, that everyone keeps talking, but maybe we'll we'll find the easier solution, some QR code which will <laughs> which will solve it, etc. So. I don't think we should be so much focused on the technology of how, but the end result, what we want to achieve. And, uh, and once, we, once we get to that end result, because I mean, same is with a drone or automatic bus machine, we shouldn't focus on the function of how, but the aim is to make it easier for the uh, customer to receive that parcel, whichever uh, justifies that means. And I, I think that that's the thing. If we, it's like, if you're alcoholic, you only start working on yourself when you admit it, and then you will say, I have a problem, I need to solve it. So we need to establish that we have a problem with the data security, and we need to start working with that in order to make sure that actually the data flow from order to the delivery remains the same, that we don't change that. If we actually, all of us say that that's a problem, then we, will, we have the global workforce to solve that. I think um, um, technology, we all know, technology moves faster than the rules and regulations, right? So blockchain did come, it was a really good technology, it still is, but our rules and regulations did not change. As you were mentioning, the airline still has to have a paper manifest, which is very different from the manifest that was given to the truck driver at the uh, source uh, original um, location. Uh, so while, rules and regulations are catching up, I think technology will still move further. So in my mind, blockchain is more a word that is being used for integrity of data, right? And, and we call it blockchain today. It could be a completely different technology tomorrow, but, and that's what um, vendors like AWS are working on is how do we provide that to ensure that that integrity of data is carried through. Um, so I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball to say whether blockchain will be there, but yes, there will be tools that will ensure that there is integrity and there's transparency to the data that moves through your supply chain. Um, just on a light note, as a, as a technology uh, guy, uh, we always fall into the trap of, of building a solution and then looking for the problem in which to, to solve this. Um, so to your point, uh, almost, uh, I'd say, eight or nine years ago, uh, blockchain started coming up, and, and in the International Bureau, we brought all together all the experts in IT, uh, looked for the most uh, conversant person on blockchain, asked them to come, spend a whole day um, understanding it, asking all the questions, so all our IT experts subjected this poor guy to a lot of questions to explain what is blockchain. That was, that was one big issue. At the end of it, we, we had an exercise where we asked all of them, please, you're all experts in the UPU, you, you, do, you work on different technologies, uh, give us solutions uh, for that. And so I got lovely Excel uh, sheet with different use cases and what have you. And then we put that all together and had another brainstorming session saying what is possible. 
And, and then we thought, well, we have some ideas from, from these guys. Let's see whether our posts will be interested. And we kept that there. Unfortunately, no interest. And this is eight years ago. Yeah. So there's a reason why I didn't say blockchain in all my presentation. I, I think, uh, uh, Dipti, you got it perfectly right. It's about trust. It's about ways of ensuring the integrity of data. And we, we spend a lot of time uh, doing this. So, so for me, blockchain, I'm waiting very uh, patiently for a real use case. We have said severally as the UPU, we are more than happy um, to host nodes uh, of blockchain uh, platforms uh, for the simple reason that if there is indeed a situation where there is a global use case, uh, we as a UPU, again, intergovernmental, we're in the perfect position to hold this sensitive data in a neutral legal space. That is what value we can, we can bring uh, to our postal sector. So this doesn't have to be just for designated postal operators, but also for the operators and their partners. So this is our positioning. And we're, we're waiting to support, but we want to see this uh, use case. Thank you. Thank you. Probably do you also want to say something about this blockchain topic, just what your idea about it is? Uh, I don't know whether blockchain? it's something that Escher is also considering or not. Is, is blockchain something that we're mm. considering? Or whether you see a future but, uh, in the postal? Like I said, our retail platform is built on distributed ledger technology. We're already blockchain. I've been for 30 years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so no, it's not something we're considering. <laughs> we did it already. <laughs> Okay, perfect. I think we are out of time already and uh, I promised everybody so that uh, for the afternoon session we stick to the time and to finish time. We are going to have a break now of 15 minutes, come then back uh, with the sustainability topic. But before we leave, please give a big applause to our four panelists here that did really a great job. Thank you very much.